Hey, hey, Tony Gaskins here. Now, I receive a, a bit too many requests to discuss this topic. And then some of y'all emailed it to me, DM'd it to me. And, and then I seen uh, one of the videos that was sent to me. It was from a like a gossip blog and they were reviewing it. And basically, it, it seemed like a lot of people was happy that Cam Newton got told, I guess, about himself to his face, which is I'm hoping it could be effective. But I, I really don't think it will be effective because, for one, he's a grown man. Two, he, he knows what he's doing with his life in the sense of, you know, procreating and having kids. Three, I think that he needs to hear that from a man. And most men won't care to say that to his face. You know, I would tell him and I think it would land differently just because as men, we, we view the world a certain way. And a lot of men won't admit this. But um, as a man, we're not really going to take a woman serious who it for one, we really don't take women serious. Society shows that even Cam Newton having, you know, multiple children from multiple women shows that on average your typical everyday man does not take a woman serious meaning like listening life shows that when you look at 16 year old boys with their mom they show love to their mom and they love their mom but they're going to test their mom they're going to push their mom they're going to ignore their mom's instructions a lot of times one thing that men respond to is men and a woman can give a man the game about women, like tell him about women and tell him what to look out for. But a woman kind of checking and trying to hold a man accountable, it's not really that effective. And if you don't believe it, you just got to sit down and just look around and pay attention to society. Now, women are catalysts in a man's life when a man allows a woman to be a catalyst in his life. I can tell that in this interview, it wasn't that Cam Newton was disrespecting the lady or didn't necessarily respect her. He he respects her, but we also put women in a box when they carry themselves a certain way. So Cam's energy would have been totally different if it was like a Michelle Obama dressed type of woman and educated type of woman one thing with this doctor stuff is i know a lot of people in the speaking industry who have doctor before their name and it's an honorary doctorate so if we don't take and do the due diligence and go look it up we don't know if someone was given a honorary doctorate from this you know word of evangelical university incorporated and i received an email from that one of them type of schools to give me an honorary doctorate and i turned it down just because i don't and not to say that the young lady has one i don't know where her doctorate is from and i feel like if it was like a michelle obama type of thing like went to princeton went to harvard or something that would have been stated but i don't really put too much on the doctor stuff just because I know a lot of people who have a doctorate and it literally means absolutely nothing. It means, and I've saw a lot of people get doctorates and do a lot of it online where they had a friend or a family member doing the work. And then they, when they had to show up in class, they showed up in class. They had the, the paper, the dissertation written by somebody else. And so I, I don't put too much on that. Like I don't look down on myself or anything when I'm seeing that type of stuff. But as men, we we do judge women. We judge men. We judge everything in the sense of I'm using the word judge, but we evaluate because we are hunters, because we are warriors. We're able to read people. So what a lot of people don't really see if you because I noticed it was like 90 percent women that was in the comments everywhere I seen it. What a lot of women don't understand is that a man could read a woman. So Cam could read that woman. Cam could read that if he really wanted to, he could put some meat leg on her. Like he he knows that. Like if he shot his shot, 
in a real way, even though she says she don't want a man with kids, he know he got the money, he got the influence, he got the talk game that she that is her preference, but she'll come down off of it. She will come right down off of that quickly. And a man could read that and he would have to go and go through the motions to find out if she wouldn't. And so it was a lot of tactics in there. And then she is labeled self-proclaimed the psychology expert. And, but I didn't hear what her doctorate is in. I didn't hear where the doctorate is from, nor did I hear if the doctorate is in psychology. But she is she has self-proclaimed herself as a psychology expert. Now, for those of y'all who know me, you know, that's a red flag for me because based on the definition of expert cam newton is an expert i'm an expert you're an expert in something we all are experts because all the expert is is someone with a lot of experience in a certain area but someone who is a psychology expert should also know that if a dress is two sizes too small and you're sitting across from a young voracious high vitality man who has multiple children from multiple women which also speaks to his a weak area in his life of being able to like settle down with one woman and commit to one woman and have as many children as she can have and is willing to have with one woman he struggles with being able to control himself around breast being out and curves being shown and so here comes the psychology expert and sits in a very revealing outfit that was not flattering and it was doing the most with too much breast out and i didn't see a single woman nowhere in the comments mention that but as men we aren't actually allowed to say that because we're seen as insecure or controlling or something like that when it's really just calling a spade a spade so me personally as a man with the way that she presents herself and we have to realize and understand that perception is reality and we don't get to dictate and determine how someone perceives us so we have to portray ourselves the way we want to be perceived based on based on societal constructs so for example i'm sitting here today and i have on a t-shirt and i have on a necklace that a lot of rappers and athletes wear and i have on a watch that a lot of rappers and athletes wear so that's gonna put me in a certain box and i'm not going to be perceived like a jordan peterson I also do not have doctor in front of my name. So I'm not going to be perceived on the same level as a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or a doctor such and such. And we have to understand perception. And men have to understand the perception of women and women have to understand the perception of men in order for the conversation to really have any grounds to stand on like in order for the communication to be clear we have to understand how we are perceived so me personally i would never take advice or correction from a woman with her breast out and with a body contour dress on she would have to be dressed more covered up more in a way that her body is not set up to distract me while i'm trying to listen because psychology understands if you understand psychology then you understand the psychology of the male mind and you understand that men are that humans are programmed by the media and what we see and what we experience so you understand that from a young age, boys are enamored with boobs. And you understand that grown men are enamored with boobs and curves because 
that is the physical specimen that we are attracted to and you understand mating and you understand mating calls and you understand mating seasons and you understand be fruitful and replenish the earth so you understand that if you show a lot of nakedness a lot of skin that a man who has a high blood flow could have a physical reaction in his pants even though his mind is fighting to not go there because his brain says hey this is a female you are a male males and females are supposed to mate you are seeing the things that turn you on based on your programming and your past experience so it is time to be turned on to have an erection and to get closer to this female and for the male and female to procreate whereas a man does not have those feelings for someone who he has put in his mind as his mother or his sister or a platonic friend so a woman should position herself when she's trying to reach a man and she's trying to get through to a man she should position herself as one of those female figures in his life instead of like someone that he is accustomed to shooting his shot at when you're trying to have a productive conversation now this is what you will understand if you are a psych psychology expert and you would understand it's just it's no different than if a woman is attracted to a man's physique if I go to have a therapy session with a woman and I've been like working out and I have like chest and arms. I wouldn't go to the therapy session with a button down shirt that is buttoned, unbuttoned to here and showing chest and showing some of the things that women like about a man's little crevice of the chest, whether that's chest hairs or what have you and i wouldn't go in with really really tight pants on that grabs my area and like holds it up against my thigh and like lays it out straight against my thigh and shows the girth and sit with my legs open to have a productive conversation because this woman is also a human and she can start to get hot and, and be in heat because this is someone that she can mate with. And that's just a part of the instincts of human, which uh, some people call animal instincts, but it's human nature. So for me, based using the doctor's terminology, the whole conversation was low functioning to me. Like it was low functioning from the start. You know, for, for one, he had on skin tight pants. And he's a former NFL player. So anybody know anything about the NFL, you got legs like a horse, you know, not no, like a stallion in the sense of big old thighs and stuff. And if you know anything about a woman, then, you know, some women are attracted to a man's physique and things of that nature. So he got on skin tight pants. He's sitting with his legs crossed. He's smoking a cigar, which if you don't smoke, that smoke is gonna affect your breathing. It also could affect your thinking because it could give you a, a little bit of a contact buzz, not in a real sense, cause it's a cigar. I mean, it's not like marijuana, but it still just alters the chemistry of the room and it's not conducive to a good conversation and it also speaks to an addiction and it could be just some type of whatever it is but for the aesthetic or what have you just like shannon sharp does the the whiskey which also throws a conversation off because of what alcohol does to the brain and to just to the system in itself so in her words, the doctor's words, the whole conversation to me was low functioning. I did listen to it for research purposes because so many people sent it to me. It took me a long time to get through it. And it was a lot of word salad. It really was, to me, a bunch of nothing.
it was a bunch of nothing. It didn't really drive any real points home and it didn't really make any, it didn't have any headway because also when you are understanding psychology, then you understand the way communication works and you understand the psychology, the psychosis of a man and, and who you're talking to. And you understand you wrap in and you understand that here's a person who has been an athlete his whole life. He has been treated special by a lot of women and by a lot of men. And he has been idolized and admired. And he has been in a position of power, in a position of influence. So when he asks you, where are you from? You simply say, I'm from Los Angeles, California. And then you allow him to go to his next question. And you don't take as a psychology expert and answer a three word answer with a 10 minute monologue because it it loses the audience because some people are just kind of stepping in to peek in to see you know what what this is about and so when you are in a conversation you're playing tennis you're not playing james harden basketball which if those of you don't watch basketball and you don't understand that james harden he does isolation basketball where it's five people on the floor but when the ball comes to him instead of taking a couple of dribbles and shooting or taking a couple of dribbles see if he has anything and shooting or passing, he keeps the ball for almost the com the full time his team is allowed to have the ball. And he shoots majority of the shots. And so the other four people are basically just his rebounders. And that's isolation basketball. And that's what she, the psychology expert, the doctor, was doing with the conversation. She was isolating the conversation and she made it like her soapbox her diatribe her monologue and that was frustrating cam and he showed a lot of respect and he showed a lot of restraint and he showed a lot of emotional intelligence by listening for so long and not like jumping in and cutting her off and he tried to nicely tell her like hey let's move the story forward like I'm asking you a question and you're taking 10 minutes to answer the question. So also, if you're a psychology expert, and that's why for me, the word expert is a red flag. I could put expert in my name and call myself a relationship expert or whatever type of expert, but I've never titled myself an expert or a guru. And it's for that reason alone is because we should always approach life as a servant as a humble servant and not give ourselves a title and even if other people call it's a lot of people who call me a relationship expert when i'm going on interviews and i will tell them i'm not a expert i don't title myself an expert i'm just using my story and my experiences to help other people and what people have to realize about therapy is all therapy is is it's a study of human behavior and the treatment plans are based on studies so the stuff that i talk about in these videos like the other day i was describing something with men from real life because i'm not a therapist and I don't put my worth and all of that into man-made society. God qualifies who he calls. And that's clear and it's evident when the power of God is on someone's life because I don't even have a college degree. But yet I, and yes, I'm back in school now online. I don't know if I will go all the way through with it and get a degree, but I'm going to see what it's talking about. But I don't allow man to define me and man's, degrees and all of that to define me but i was describing something in a, a, another video and people were coming in the comments with these therapy topics like oh that is and these different 
attachment styles. Oh, the attachment styles describes this or avoidant attachment and attachment avoidant, like using these terms that they've heard from a book, not realizing that the book is from a man or a woman and that man or a woman studied people's lives and they took their human, their English vocabulary and they gave a word to describe it. But that word is just from that human who took and had the audacity and the innovative mind to say avoidant attachment or the attachment theory. But the person is no different than you and I. They've studied and seen the same thing that you and I have seen, but they were just the first to the table. They were the first to the ball game. So they got to write the book that now every other human takes and says, hey, this became the standard. This is what I have to study. This is what I have to learn. I can't really refute it or disagree with it because it's based on human study. I can confirm that this stuff is real and this is the terminology. When we could take and create our own terminology. So low functioning, high functioning is no different than my grown boy, grown man, grown girl, grown woman. It's just different terminology. It's, it's, it's word salad. And in there, they're talking about, can you be, you know, she's telling Cam that he can be high functioning and low value. Or he can be low functioning and high value. And you could be high functioning and high value. It's, just, it's a word salad. It literally is just her definitions. And just like low value man and all of this stuff that came about. For me, I don't describe a man as high value just because he has money. For me, a high value man is a man who is in complete submission to his creator. That's a high value man. And for me, that would be a high functioning man. And but all of this stuff is subjective because when I worked in the group home with men who their paperwork said bipolar, schizophrenic, mildly retarded, they had all these different terminologies on their paperwork. They were considered low functioning. So for the doctor and psychology expert to call a man low functioning, my mind takes me back to men who live in a group home and aren't seen as fit to live on their own in society. And that was the term that the behavioral specialists and the behavioral scientists use for these men, low functioning. So that's where you have to be careful with all this word salad and all the semantics because it just is or it ain't it is or it ain't all these words and you could come up with your own words and what you have to realize about something like with a cam newton and a lot of people don't think about this like cam was a star athlete and he was raised as a star athlete and he went to the University of Florida. I played football in college, so I'm a little familiar with the sport. He went to the University of Florida. He ended up transferring, and they said it was a little bit of trouble at Florida, like stealing a laptop or something. Could be true, could not be true. He went to Auburn and did his thing, starting corner quarterback at Auburn. But when you look at, as a man, when we look at Cam Newton, you see like someone who got hand carved. You see the prototypical athlete body. Like if you could design the body of an athlete, it would look like a Cam Newton and or like a Shannon Sharp. Like they are the prototypes. It's, it's a little slight difference, you know, because Shannon, he works out hard and stuff like that still. And he he's more you know, naturally muscular. And Cam probably got a few little drops of other cultures. Shannon probably got a little less of other cultures and got that more pure African blood. Whereas just, I always take people back to the primal days of like on the battlefield when one 
territory, one tribe going against another tribe. Like imagine, and, and all you got is that little, that little tarp thing around your waist. And it's just that little flap over your booty, that little flap over the front and everything else, you naked. And you got the weapon that you done made. You put me in that outfit. You put Shannon Sharp in that outfit. You put Cam Newton in that outfit. I'm going home. I'm going home. You put me right up. I'm going home. I got I got to go. All right. Y'all can have it. Y'all can have it. What what over here do y'all want? All right. It's yours. It's yours. But that what people don't understand though is society doesn't praise that. Like society don't see them like that until they get money. Society as a young man with a big body, big muscle bound body you're going to be seen and back in the day you're going to be seen as weird like today you'll be seen as a phenom because we understand sports and the millions of dollars these people will make so soon as somebody come out the womb if they go to walking right and jump around we see millions but back in the day having the the, the look that like a cam newton had that he has it could have he could have looked awkward to some women he could have just looked different they could have been more accustomed to like a five foot eight five foot ten man with a little lean frame and that also plays into like when a man comes into himself he could have also been very sheltered i think he said his dad is a pastor or something like that he could have been sheltered and he could have been protected from the world instead of prepared for the world and his parents have been married for decades but yet he is living the opposite lifestyle and that a lot of times is a result of a child being too sheltered and just too parented like over parented and then get out into the world and rebel because you want to see the world i have a similar experience being an athlete but not really raised and pushed real hard in athletics but being in a church every time the doors was open and my dad was a pastor as well for 14 years of my life and i became a womanizer and a drug dealer and a thief and a college dropout it comes from you seeking experiences and you seeking exposure because you've always had just stability and a sound foundation to where you want to see what the other side is like and but the bible says train a child up in the way that he should go and when he is old he won't depart from it so cam newton is really in a prolonged prodigal son season it's just very prolonged but what you also got to realize the way he plays the game he's very tough He's very strong. I'm pretty sure he's taken a lot of hits to the head. I am in partnership with a neurosurgeon and we're working on a project that we may or may not bring to fruition, but we've had a lot of good talks about it. And when I told her some of the, the hits that I took in football in college, she started grimacing. And she was just like, oh, my goodness, Tony. Oh, my goodness. Like, and this is a neurosurgeon, like someone who does surgery on the brain and the spine. And she understands the brain inside and out. And, and just in one conversation, enlightened me about the brain. And I thought that I could create an app that you remember the sequence of colors or numbers that you just saw. And she told me, Tony, that's actually not going to do anything for the brain if you're not exercising with it. She like, if you don't do like 25 jumping jacks or like some squats or something in between those exercises, the brain is not going to regenerate. And I was like, wow, that is how one time I sat on the plane doing the brain app and I'm remembering all this stuff and I'm clicking all this stuff. And I got up and I forgot my thousand dollar backpack that was above my head for the first time in my entire flying life. I forgot my carry on above my head after I was sitting down for an hour or two doing a brain training app. It fried my brain. Well, I forgot my carry on. And so I'm talking to her, I'm learning about the brain. And that's what a lot of people have to realize is like with football players and boxers and MMA, all of us are unique and special individuals because of the head trauma that we have had. 
And we don't even fully understand how our personality has been changed and how our attachment styles have been changed and how our thought process has been changed because we are not brain experts. We are the victim in the situation to the brain trauma. So a psychology expert also has to understand that. And that is why as a psychology expert, you would never give a five minute answer to someone who has played a brain traumatizing game their entire life. You will shrink all of your answers to 60 to 120 seconds so that he or she can fully process it and then give you what's on their heart and mind because it is their show and their platform. So she created a very tense environment and Cam could see her. A lot of people don't, don't see that right there. Cam could see her. What you have to understand is a man is also a warrior. So we are protectors. So we could read somebody in 0.5 seconds. He could see the spirit on her, the Jezebel spirit, not the Holy Spirit. She has absolutely zero Holy Spirit. Cam has absolutely zero Holy Spirit, but we still have spirits. Both of them have a little bit of a Jezebel spirit on them. He could see that. So he was trying to tiptoe around being offensive. But he was very valid in the points that he kind of almost tried to make. Which he was saying, basically what he was trying to say in the nicest way possible is how do you know anything about love and relationships when you are 41 and single and you've never been married and never had children? It's, it's the same irony of oprah being and who she said she's friends with oprah it's the same thing of oprah being the voice i saw it one time it was like a quote somebody said like how can oprah be the voice like the authority on family like the household and family and marriage and she's never been married and never had kids but that's america that is America. That our country should be called the United States of irony, the United States of contradiction, the United States of juxtaposition, because we put a felon in office to run the country. When my uncle is doing a 27 year sentence, for $20 worth of drugs. A felon is running for office. Someone who has filed bankruptcy several times is running for the highest position in the land. So here we have a single person who does not have children giving therapeutic treatment plans to people to help them with their marriage and their parenting, so to speak. So she's giving parenting advice to Cam Newton and relationship advice, but she has not been able to make it work for herself. And that right there, it that's why I don't think any of what she said will really take root in Cam's life because Cam comes from an industry where you got to show me better than you tell me because I work with pro athletes and I've never been a pro athlete, but I work with them in the areas that I've had success in being a husband, being a father, being a entrepreneur, and being a mature man, that's where I helped them grow. But if I worked with Cam Newton's NFL team, I wouldn't go into the locker room and talk to them about talk to him about taking snaps and talk to him about leading his team to victory in the game. I would talk to him about how he lives off the field 
and how he treats his woman, not being an abusive man and not being a controlling man and not being a jealous man. And I would share my areas of failure in that and then share my areas and show my areas of success in that. So that is why as a life coach, I have psychotherapists and psychiatrists who are my clients because they understand that their schooling did not make them an expert in understanding men and understanding relationships because you're just reading books and taking tests. But those books and tests are far different than what you may experience on a day to day basis. And that's why the young lady is still single or she could have a situation ship that she would never talk about. And there could be men who are very high profile, who don't kiss and tell, who have been with her and women like her. And we would never know. We would never know. It's not something she's going to talk about. And most men, it is seen as very feminine for a man to come out and tell what he's done. Like the guy, Loose Cannon, I don't know if he was drunk or high or if that's uh, he literally a loose cannon. But when he went on that show, I believe it was Adam 22. And he said that he slept with Shawnee O'Neal two weeks before her marrying Keon Henderson. Like that, that right there is like a violation, like a man, me giving the game and explaining the male mindset is a val is a violation. That's why Cam Newton has not brought me on his show. That's why Nick Cannon have not brought me on his show. Because what I'm doing is exposing the immaturity and the weakness of men in that mental state. And they know that if a man says it, it is confirmed. If a man says it, it takes root. The reason why Nick Cannon and Cam Newton, which I wrote both of them un in the DM on Instagram, Nick Cannon responded, but never brought me on his show. Cam Newton has not responded yet. But there is a reason why they have not brought me on their show. Because men know men. Now, I'm having a monologue because I'm not in a conversation. And you can pause this, do what you got to do, come back to it. I'm not talking to another person. But if I ever go on their shows and, and if, if 100, 200 of y'all go to their comment and say, bring Tony Gaskins on your show, they producer may say, listen, we got to have this conversation. What you scared of? Like, why are you running from it? Like, what did he do to you? And so we'll sit down and have a conversation. Now, in that, you will see us go back and forth and we'll have a conversation. Now, the stuff that she said to Cam, it needed to be said to him. But I don't think she's in a position to say it. Because, again, like I was about to say, Cam come from the show me state, not literally the state. But, I mean, in sports, you will hear Shador Sanders just said it not long ago in an interview. He said. He said, I don't listen to the opinions of people who don't take snaps. He said, you get out there and you get sacked 50 times and then you tell me what your footwork going to be like. Then you tell me what your foot like footwork going to be like. So guess what? I would never talk to Shador Sanders about taking snaps because I've never taken I've taken snaps, but not at that level. So I don't know nothing about that. Being a quarterback at the division one level in the pack 12 and now the big 12 or whatever the pack 10 not in big 12 i don't know nothing about that so i can't tell him what that's like his daddy can't even tell him what that's like because his daddy wasn't no quarterback he can tell him about the intensity of the game at division one level because daddy played at florida state daddy played in the nfl he could tell him about that but he can't even fully listen to his daddy about quarterback advice that's why his daddy brought in tom brady so with men, you have to show me what you're talking about. I only want to hear a relationship come out of man's mouth who not married. I only want to hear it come out your mouth if you're not married. So here you have a single woman or publicly single woman who is not married and no man that she's met where she falls inside of the category of pretty and that's subjective beauty is in the eye of the beholder 
me, I, I look at people and I see their spirit. So she is not attractive to me because I could see her spirit. And when you walk with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit allows you to see the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I know she don't have the Holy Spirit in her is because she was cursing. And you cannot use profanity. You it's it. I'm incapable of cursing. Like I. The only way I could curse is if I completely separate myself from the Holy Spirit because it's profanity. It is a filthy word. And so you you could even Google. What does the Bible say about cursing or what does the Bible say about curse words or what the Bible say about filthy words, profanity? And then, of course, if you want to get into semantics and oh well, who says cursing is profanity? Our society, our world. The, the FCC, your schoolhouse, your church. If if it wasn't profanity, we would teach our kids to curse. Every kid would be using the S word and the D word and the A word and the F word from the time that they could talk. That would be one of the first words we teach them. If it's not cursing, the Bible say obey the laws of the land. It is a curse word. That's why it's bleeped out. That's why your news reporters and your television hosts cannot use curse words. Now they've loosened to where they let them use the, the D word or the H word, talking about where Satan lives, Satan's house. They let them use the H word. They may let them use the A word on ESPN and this different stuff, but you're not finna use no F word, the S word, none of none of that, mf -er. And she was using these terms. And that let me know the Holy Spirit ain't in the room. Just point blank, period. It just is what it is. It is or it ain't. The Holy Spirit is not in the room, just like with that pastor that I told y'all about. Pastor Tim, or I don't know what I think that's his name, who he used to wear the yellow glasses. And somebody, one of y'all sent me an interview he did over a decade ago on um blog talk radio. On uh, if you do stuff like this you probably remember blog talk radio but it's from years and years and years ago ring um from blog talk radio and they had a little picture of him and in that and on that picture he had a like a carved face he had a carved face he had glasses or or he could have had no glasses on. He had a card face, like it was real puffy cheeks, real puffy everything. And then he had a low cut, like lower than this, real low cut. And just, he looked like the guy in the classroom that nobody sees. That nobody, that you he's either getting bullied or he's getting ignored that's what he looked like but then somewhere along the way he becomes cool he starts thinking he's cool and he starts trying to be cool and he gets a position in power being a youth pastor and then he has his team he said this out his mouth he had his whole team read Lil Wayne lyrics because you got to read the song and know about this stuff in order to reach these kids. And that is an absolute 100% lie. But you don't know that if you've never been him. When you have been him, you realize who you want to speak into your life is not someone who speaks the same language of you. Someone who speaks a different and a better language than you. You don't want somebody who can quote Lil Wayne. You want somebody who can live and exist on a higher level when you want to grow and change. When you want to be comfortable in your sin, that's when you want somebody who looks like you, walk like you, talk like you. And I remember James Harden, the NBA player that I was talking about, he used to give me a hard time because I, I was a life coach in the NBA. And I worked with several NBA athletes and players and teams. And he used to be like, man, what, man, what are our life coach doing with a Rolex? 
hey man put your chain in i, I used to have a gold necklace and it'll be out and him and patrick beverly will come up and do like this and tuck my chain kind of like initiation trying to punk me man, hey put your chain in. man don't let that chain hang out man put your chain in your shirt man you got on a gold chain man you got on a rolex man you got on ball main jeans i see you i see you you got on louis vuitton shoe man who you think you is man man you supposed to be dressed like these other guys because the executives in the front office which was who i was working with they came in suits and i remember the president of the team tad brown i came in and, and my pants was like camo and i had on like camo pants with some louis vuitton shoes and like a a t-shirt like a suede type of shirt it was like this but it was like almost like suede and a blazer and the fit was hard now nah, but they was like you need to they was look they didn't tell me nothing but they i could see it because communication is 70 percent body language 70 percent non-verbal so i could see it but and and james Harden didn't realize what he was saying he realized what he was saying but he didn't just say it in that way but in essence, what he was saying is, how can I listen to you when you look and act, when you not act, when you look and dress just like me? I expect you to be different, to dress different, to present yourself differently and be on a higher level. And I remember a pro athlete was talking to me about his teammate and he said he said he talks about god and he pretends to be a christian and talk about god but he listens to young thug he comes in the locker room and he turns on young thug i ain't listening to him i can't respect him how you listen to young thug and then you talking about god it got to be one or the other. So this is just a clear and concise consensus. This is perception. So we fail in the areas of perception sometimes, not by not understanding it. So that's what you have to realize. So here comes a woman and she's dressed like a Instagram thought. Like there are Instagram models who wear that same dress. But we've never seen Michelle Obama in that dress. We've never seen Oprah in that dress. So therefore, because of the association, the perception associations, because of how we view people, we place people in different boxes. If a man has dreads, we put him in a box than a man who has what we would call locks. They're the same thing, but for one person, he wanted to mean what many people associate it with, which is strength rebellion toughness personal identity and don't give a care what nobody thinks and then you have somebody else who have them very neat very twisted they're not like the tree trunk so cam newton's whole persona is it's an act of rebellion but for to put it in a nicer way, it's really like exploration. It's no different than Colin Kaepernick starting wearing a fro and taking a knee. It's like technically in society, Colin Kaepernick would be too light skinned to take a knee. Because we believe in society that light-skinned people get privilege. Pretty privilege. Light-skinned privilege. So it's like, why aren't the dark-skinned NFL players who's been called monkey and the N-word throughout their life and been discriminated against, why aren't they taking a knee? Why is someone who is, 
I believe half white and I think was raised by white people taking this stance for black people. Why is Amanda Seals, who has this look and image of the light skinned pretty girl and who was on Disney or something like that as a young age, why is she the loudest voice for black women versus someone who a dark skinned woman like Viola Davis, who we know based on colorism could have a harder life. Why did Jesse Williams, the light skinned person, give the speech about black power at the BET Awards? And why did the half white Malcolm X become a leader for the nation of Islam? And then Prophet Elijah Muhammad, the light skinned person, and Dr. Louis Farrakhan, I don't know if he's a doctor, I mean, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, the light skinned man with the with the very soft, good silk hair become the voice of black plight and black people when his look is accepted in a lot of rooms because of the lighter skin. So you see what I mean? Sometimes there's this righteous indignation where people want to be something they're not. They want to experience something they haven't experienced. That's why I became a drug dealer because I was raised in a two parent home and I felt unrightfully privileged. And that's what I see in Cam Newton because typically people with the hairstyles that Cam has, I don't know if he didn't cut it because he always have a hat, hat on, but typically growing up in Florida, guys with that hairstyle that Cam has, they was the killers. There was a lot of them was was Haitian. There was those. They, they was the, the roughest, toughest guys. Like if you had dreads, we call them dreads. The politically correct term is locks. Now I was enlightened. <laughs> they still dread to be. We call them dread. That was the toughest guys. Like and so what you notice is guys who wanted a shield, guys who wanted to be seen differently started to get dreads. Be, and because it was protection, that hair, even in the Bible with Samson, is armor. It's your strength. And it literally in the streets gave you protection. So me having hazel eyes, it made guys call me soft, even though I was born with the with a lighter color eye, a different color eye. Guys w thought I was soft to the point that when I took my helmet off, after rushing for 200 yards in a game, the other team, the black guys who would be two, three shades darker than me, have a nose that's wider than mine, have lips that's bigger than mine, and fit more the traditional black face that America tried to traumatize us with and belittle us and talk about us, they would look at me and be like, I remember loud and clear. We played a team out of Miami or something like that. Broward, not Dade. It was either Broward County or Dade County. It was something. They were from down south. I'm from Polk County, Florida. And we played a team. And I, I think I had like 240 yards or something like that. And we were shaking hands. I had took my helmet off. We going through the line. We shaking hands. And it was a group of black guys, two, three guys. They were like, that's what he looked like. That's what he looked like. And I didn't, but, so my only association is that everybody called me pretty boy. Like, my homeboys called me pretty Ricky. So my only association to what they were saying, because I'm like, what do you mean is that what I look like? I'm like, am I supposed to look a certain way to just put that thrashing on y'all that I just put on y'all? But, like, in the media... I'm going to tell you what, like toughness, like when you look at the pivot, the podcast, the pivot. Shannon Crowder has dreads, but now his would be like locks or you could call them twists. But guess what? Channing is also light skin. So light skin, just like the rapper D1. D1 has locks. He said he answered in an interview. They said, why you got locks? You know, and he said, because people thought because I was so high yellow is what they call it, that I couldn't lock up. So I literally locked up just to prove to them that my hair is just as kinky as yours, like that, that I could lock up. So if you notice light skin guys like D1, 
and Channing, who are very outspoken, very public figures, but they also have locks because in the black culture, locks represent strength. Cam Newton, who was raised with a mother and a father, who sounds like his parents are still married, and his dad, I think he said it was a pastor, goes and gets locks. Goes and gets dreads, not locks, because he got the tree trunk. Sometimes he'll look like the tree trunk uh, locks, which puts you in a totally different box. And so towards the end of his career, he goes from a guy who was in the video at the University of Auburn with a low cut like this. He go from this low cut to tree trunk locks and starts making this huge statement with his clothes. So his hair and his outfits became louder than his game. The same thing with Colin Kaepernick, his stance. He started kneeling when he got benched. When he became a second string quarterback, he started taking a knee because he was crying out for attention and he disrupted the entire NFL till he got booted out of the NFL and it had nothing to do truthfully with him caring about black men being killed in the street because I guarantee you he cares no more about them black men being killed by police than any other black man in the NFL who did not take a knee because he knows this is America and this is how I feed my family. And me taking a knee during the national anthem is not going to stop one police from pulling that trigger against a black man who is unarmed in the street. But what it is going to do is it's going to upset this organization. It's going to upset these patriots and these fans that's in this in this audience. And it's going to get me kicked off of this team and i'm no longer going to be able to feed my family and i have not done enough yet to put up enough millions and enough money to have my family set up so it's not that i'm not angry it's not that i don't want to mask up and go take the life of this police but i have to take care of my children and my family who i got to look in the eyes every day and me taking a knee is not worth losing all of that because it's black people killing black people in the streets too. And me taking that knee is not finna stop no police from pulling that trigger. It actually gonna make them pull it faster because he mad at my race now and he mad at my position in life. So that was the quiet part said loud. That's what nobody could say. And it probably was a couple people who said it, but they didn't let it go viral. And we also was under we also was looking at it like truthfully, like you light skinned, bro. Like you ain't had no problem. Like, ain't your family white? Like, were you raised by white people in a two-story house or something? Like, bro, you ain't come out no struggle. Like, what the world are you need for? But I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, at that time when he took that knee, he was a second string quarterback. So I said, This him pitching a fit for being a second string quarterback. This ain't got nothing to do with these kids getting killed in the street. Same thing with Cam Newton. Cam started being rebellious to the later part of his career. But at Auburn, he had a low cut and he looked like a professional. He looked like, and that's why I try to tell guys, don't go look like, like the toughest guy in the media right now. Like the toughest, least scared men in the media got a low cut. They don't have locks like the thugs in Miami, like they don't have. And, and, and I know that's going to offend a lot of guys. I got a lot of homeboys and friends that had locks, but we all, I used to have dreads <laughs> and we used to try to grow the dreads. But I, when I get, went to get my twist, get, get my retwisted, I went to a different person and she twisted them the, the wrong way. And they were still so fresh because they was only about this long. So it made them puffy. Cause she twisted them the other way. I guess she was right handed or, or left handed. The other person with the other hand, so she twisted them the wrong way. So now I had like these little thing that was like puffs, and they hadn't locked up yet. So I just had to rip on through them and just comb it out. And then I went to braids. But we did that to look tough. I used to have six gold teeth. We did that to look tough. It, it wasn't to look cool. We knew we looked this stupid. 
we knew that dreads and goals made us look like thugs. We knew that, but that's what we wanted to look like. We want to look dangerous, just like the boys in California. I thought Nipsey Hussle say stay dangerous, or whoever YG say stay dangerous, because you want to look dangerous. Why you think like like another example? Nipsey Hussle, he is a light skinned guy. What did he do? He went and got a big beard, and he went and got the braids. That right there, that gives you a shield. It say you willing to buck the system. You don't look corporate. You look street. You look tough. The tattoos in the face, the, the sleeve of tattoos, the big gold chains, all of that says you have strength to go against the grain and to be your own person and to be lumped in with thugs and gangsters and killers and you associated. You gang affiliated. That's why Soldier Boy tried to become gang affiliated. That's why all these rappers try to become gang affiliated. For protection. Because if you don't link up and get that protection, you're going to get devoured. And so this is what you got to understand when you're reading men. So the reason why Cam Newton have three baby mamas and he have multiple kids, which I seen somebody in the comments say he talking, he including in the eight, he including his stepchildren. I don't know how many biological stepkids he got. He said he got eight kids. I don't know if that's all his or he counting his stepkids too. But three baby mamas, it's not that uncommon <laughs> amongst black men. My barber have multiple baby mamas. You know, my security guard got multiple baby mamas. Um, trying to think of anybody else that's close to it. Like, it, it's not that uncommon. Like, because we aren't necessarily taught like we see things and you try to learn but if you're not if it's not laid out for you if you're not talked to directly and i'm gonna tell you who in the media on the podcast the pivot which i know he has struggles behind closed doors and he, he goes through his own things and he and he has a lot of head trauma as well but i really respect his stance and his strength and men know men and that's ryan clark and uh, Fred Taylor, too, but Fred is a he probably a little less. He he probably closer to Cam Newton than he meaning like in lifestyle than he is to Ryan Clark. And Ryan Clark probably is who he is, you know, off the scene. But publicly, he's a he's a father and he's a husband. And another thing he is not is scared. Like. You could listen to Ryan Clark, Clark and you could look at Ryan Clark. And even though he's not six foot six or six four and 260 all muscle, you can tell in his demeanor and his conversation that there isn't a man walking the face of the earth that puts fear in his heart. And the reason why I can see that is because I am the same exact way. And he probably and a lot of people don't like to be associated with other people. But the reason why I speak the way I speak and I address stuff in a very real way is because I don't have a need to tell a lie and I don't care who likes it and who doesn't like it. And I'm not doing it to look tough or to sound tough or to posture. It's just my truth is my truth. My perception is my perception. And someone may perceive me as a fraud, as a simp, as a charlatan, as whatever it is, an opportunist. They could perceive me in their own way. But I understand is that we all speak from where we are. So if I know that I am an honest person and that I'm 100 percent faithful to my wife, and that there are women in my vicinity and women that I have coaching sessions with and conversations with that I could shoot my shot at, but I'm not shooting my shot. And no woman on the face of this earth can say she is sleeping with me other than my wife. And today, thanks to P. Diddy and other gentlemen like that, I have to say no man on the face of this earth can say he is sleeping with me. 
And the doctor said that on the show, something about men having multiple men or low functioning men having multiple women and multiple men or multiple kids. But it honestly just comes from a lack of knowledge. The multiple baby moms and the multiple children, it, it really comes from a void of not being affirmed, not feeling like you are enough and you're looking to someone else to complete you. You're seeking satiation from a human being. You're seeking completion from a connection and chemistry and camaraderie with another human being. And because of that, it is driving you from one human to another because you lack the emotional intelligence to adapt and to learn that you're not perfect and this human you're sleeping with is not perfect and you have to accept your flaws and work on your flaws and you have to accept her flaws and ask her to work on her flaws. But what happens is men get with a woman and then they start to desire things that she isn't and desire things that she doesn't have. And they fail to realize that no woman would have it all. So like Cam Newton's most recent mother of his child. I don't know her name. I can't remember if it's Jazzy or Jessica or something. I've seen some people saying in the comments. I can look at her as a, as a, from a male perspective, and my opinion is that she has beauty and she has a body and she may have a brand, but she lacks brains and when i say brands i mean brains she lacks self respect and self worth because only a woman who and and she could have her money could have been like non-existent or decreasing and a lot of women will get pregnant from what y'all call i don't call this a lot of women will get pregnant, just like the doctor said, from a high value man so that they can have a roof over their head, whether it's in under that man's roof or the man is paying for their roof because they have his child. The same thing like Nick Cannon's, the mother of his ch latest children. If a woman chooses to be added on as a multiple baby mama, she lacks brains, self-worth, and self-respect. And the, the man, <laughs> that's crazy. I, I was I had been texting my dog. One, two, three. It's an NBA all-star, perennial all-star, top 75 NBA player in the history. I won't say his name. I have been texting him, and he missed my last few texts. And then when this last text I sent him yesterday, it was my guy just checking in on you. How are things going? And what's the bis biggest lesson you've learned this year? And he said, there's a lesson to be learning everything that happens in life, and nothing is permanent. And that's deep. But, I, but I, one thing I realized about him, is again, if you're a psychology expert, you you learn how to talk to who you're talking to. For him, he's cerebral. So small talk, he don't want to do small talk. Like he want to have deep conversation. He don't want to discuss something that's on social media or something that's just nonsense. He don't want to discuss business deals or business opportunities or autographs and he want to discuss life and the complexities of life. And so I realized the only time I really get an answer from him is when it's about matters of the heart. 
it, nothing else really based on his relationship with me because of how he sees me now his homeboys he probably talk about the frivolous stuff of life and so that's what i mean with this right here so you have to understand this when you with these men who have multiple baby moms and they're and they're kind of close that's a void in that man and that is what the doctor calls low functioning now it ain't the same low functioning like what i was dealing with with the men in the group home which it, 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 it could be kind of similar, but that's what that is to where it's just a void. And when you, especially when you have brain trauma, you can become insatiable, meaning nothing satisfies you, like nothing completes you, like nothing is what it is. Like I'm, I'm so proud of Ocho Cinco. I mean, he didn't, he didn't do a lot of routes across the middle. He did do some, and yeah, he got hit by Ray Lewis, I think. But And being a receiver, I don't think he has as much head trauma as maybe like a quarterback or a running back or like a safety or, you know, cornerback. But he from Miami, Florida. So as a youth, I'm pretty sure they were doing bull in the ring, which is bull in the ring, for those of y'all don't know, is like you get in the circle and it's in somebody in the middle. And the person in the middle spin around and get dizzy. And then the coach blow the whistle. And whoever you're facing, y'all run from about five yards apart. Some some crazy coaches may have you 10 yards apart and you crash heads like Rams. And that's back in the day if you play Little League, if you play Little League football like in the in the – late 80s and 90s and stuff like that bull in the ring was a thing and and you just was hitting with your head that was before all the concussion stuff and all the proper way to tackle you your head was a spear and you use your head so what a lot of women need to understand is that if you're dealing with a black man and he played football he has brain trauma his personality has been altered he may not even realize it and i think that's why men like shannon sharp and Deion Sanders are not married. I honestly think it's com it is because of the personality changes that has happened in their brain. It makes you insatiable. I'm I have been married for 17 years, but I struggle with the same thing. I struggle with seeing my wife as enough. And I have to, and for me, it's my walk with God that gives me the emotional intelligence and the gratitude and the wisdom to know. So like, even with the doctor, she is called a psychology expert. And it was crazy that she calls herself a psychology expert. And because she calls herself a psychology expert, I saw people in the comments saying that Cam was a fool for not listening to a psychology expert. And I'm like, who made her expert? She gave herself that title. Like, you, you ain't no expert. Ain't none of us no expert. Don't none of us know what we talking about. We everybody guessing and we saying it loud and with some air in our chest. But everybody guessing. And no nobody. And so, so you sat there for two and a half hours, just like me, to get through that interview. So that's why I'm just talking uninhibited right now. But also for you to understand that when the Holy Spirit is in the room, you don't, you don't need anybody probing you with questions. You're able to speak coherently and make points just with the Holy Spirit. And a curse word is nowhere near my mind, nowhere near my heart, nowhere near my... I, if I wanted to curse right now, I would probably gag. Like, literally, if I wanted to say a curse word right now, I probably would convulse or gag because it would be in such contention with the purity and the sanctity and the sacredness of the Holy Spirit. I just cannot do it. I cannot do it. So even when I use vulgar language, like if I'm talking about sex or something like that, I try to use like different terms or when we talking about a woman being with a man in that way, I'll say singing on the microphone or a man eating peach cobbler instead of saying the the sexual terms just 
trying to get a message across, but kind of bring it down a few notches and make it a little palatable. And even with that, that still bothers my spirit. And it also bothers some other people's spirit. And there are people who have come to my channel and said, Tony, I listen to you because you don't curse. I listen to you because you say the name of God, but you don't say things that contradict the name of God. And so people are looking for that consistency. People are looking. I forgot the word was up there. People are looking for that. So if we don't go to church and if we don't go to church and hear the pastor curse, we don't want to hear the pastor curse in the pulpit. Then we don't want to hear so-called Christians cursing outside of the pulpit because the Holy Spirit ain't just in the church. It ain't even in a lot of churches today. The Holy Spirit resides within you. So if you are a self pro proclaimed or professing Christian, you should not be using profanity in no shape or form. And it's the same thing that the other young podcaster, um, B. Simone, like she always, and she talk about growing, but she shoot herself in the foot all the time because she talk about God, 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 God. And then two, two sentences later, she dropping the F-bomb. And it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. God ain't nowhere near there. God ain't, and, and people call it judgmental, but it's not judgmental. It is observational. It is knowledge and understanding of the Holy Spirit and where and how the Holy Spirit can reside. So when you read your word, <laughs> then you realize and you understand that. And let me pull this up. Hmm. And this is the new international version of James chapter three. And I'm going to just read the, the whole thing here. This is all go together. The, it's titled Taming the Tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Let me read that sentence again. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Verse three, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. But it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Out of the same mouth come praise 
and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Two kinds of wisdom. This is the rest of the chapter. I don't know if it's still talking about the same thing. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, meaning not taking sides, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's the book of James chapter three. Now in there, you will see that praise and cursing should not come from the same mouth. You should not be praising God and cursing. You will also see that we should show our wisdom by our good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. That's why I don't call myself an expert. That's why I don't give myself a title like expert or guru and all of these things that people use because in what we do, we should be humble and having a title. People want a title like doctor and like expert to be higher than other people. When if I get my doctorate, I'm not even going to have it on my name. It's going to be in my credentials and I'm going to pull it out when I need to pull it out in a meeting or in a job application. Like if I want to be the sports psychologists or psychiatrists for a professional team. And if I've gotten those credentials, that's when I will let it be known. But it doesn't have to be known worldwide unless I need to stamp it so that people know this is the field I'm working in. So not everyone who says doctor or what have you is arrogant or self-serving, but when you tie it into childhood trauma, so what I saw on the doctor is still unresolved childhood trauma from her father being a dope boy and her mom being an addict. It led to a spirit of yearning and a spirit of seeking affirmation and seeking love and seeking admiration and adulation. And that's where the desire to become a doctor and to be called an expert can be rooted in. And that's where the revealing see-through clothes, the sheer clothes, because I don't know the doctor, never met her. We actually follow each other on Instagram. I have no reason to unfollow her. I don't look at her posts. I don't look at anybody posts. I just try to follow people back if they are making moves and people of influence and have a verified account or my clients or colleagues, constituents. I try to follow them back because that means something to people. It means nothing to me. I used to only follow my wife, but then I realized a lot of people are insecure and they were in their feelings about me only following my wife. And I just don't use social media in that way. And so I started following people back. 
And a lot of people still judge you by who you follow. And I understand perception is reality. And that's also why I ain't want to follow nobody. But just trying to be somewhat normal and human, I did that. So we actually, me and the doctor actually follow each other on Instagram. I didn't know who she was. I, she was following me because I used to only follow one person. Then I seen her in my following and I followed her back. And I seen that she'd done a TV show or something like that. But I looked at her page after y'all sent me this interview. And on the page, I could see that she's very revealing. Like she shows a lot of body, a lot of breast. And similar to what Megan Good, how Megan Good would dress when she was with Devon Franklin. And to me, I don't think that's what a Christian woman does. I don't think that's what a Christian woman should do because the Bible tells us not to be a hindrance to our brethren. So if we know how we dress or what we do can be a hindrance, it, it, it just, that's not what a believer should be doing. And let me see. And so here's the thing, like if, if you are a psychology expert and you study the psychology of men and psychology of women, then you know that many men struggle with pornography, struggle with the bare skin of a woman's body. And so when you're trying to convey a message to a man, you should not probe his weakness in the sense of becoming a distraction with your breast out while you're trying to have a coherent and cohesive conversation with him. Now, that may not have triggered Cam at all because he's seen plenty of breasts in his life and been between pr plenty of legs, but only he would know that and whether he would tell the truth about it or not, I, I don't. If he was, I don't think he would say that just because you know, past choices and integrity and lack of integrity is, is is there in the history. So I don't know if he would be. But it disturbed my spirit. Like I, I just couldn't really listen to what she was saying because her outfit was so loud. And I'm just like, why, why not come in even form fitting pants that shows thighs and butt in curves but it's it's pants with a shirt and a blazer like and could have six inch heels on but like why like a body contour dress when the it just did not make sense to me and, and it just seemed too tight like she couldn't breathe and then she sat down and she had rolls in her stomach and i'm like this is just not conducive to a sit down conversation and if you understand psychology then why would you who picked this outfit so that right there just had a lot of what she said which was good stuff falling on deaf ears and that's why in every post that i've seen all women and then the men were like they was they were like cam called out or cam did this because the men gonna see it one way the women gonna see it one way and and as a woman a woman may look at her and i don't know how a woman thinks but obviously no i didn't really see any woman that was offended by her outfit or kind of turned away by her outfit and then if a woman says that a woman is typically called a hater or jealous but i'm saying as a man the outfit offended me in the sense of I want to listen to you more than look at you. And I want to hear what you're saying more than see what you're showing. And breasts should be seen at the beach and in the bedroom. But other than that, there are outfits that cover your breasts completely that still can be sexy and sophisticated so that the sound of your voice could be louder than the sound of 
this nonverbal communication, which communication is 70 percent nonverbal. So you have to think about what you are saying. So think about this. If I was sitting on here today with one of these shirts that some of these men be wearing and I had all of my chest out. And, and it came down to here and this where it was button and I'm sitting here and I got this much chest out. How many times as a woman and even men who are not into men still would be looking at my chest just to see, is there some type of form to it? Is there some is the chest hair? And just to wonder, OK, like I see this much chest. Where does it lead to? Does it lead to a a beer belly? Does it lead to abs? Does it lead to a flat stomach? Like what is going on? And then, okay, this is the chest. Where does that lead to what we call the happy trail, that little trail of hair, what that lead to? And then mm, what's in them pants? Ah, that's how a woman might start to think like, man, okay. His body fit, you know, chest on oh, what he, what he working with. And so that's what you have to think about when you are a psych psychology expert. And that is the doctor that did a post that she practically was nude. It was a see-through outfit and in the caption was selling her life coach certification. And a lot of people don't know this about life coaching because they are new to life coaching or they're a therapist, but a life coach can do none of therapy. Life coach can't do no therapy. And I seen on her page, she got a hybrid certification where it's like therapy and life coaching. A therapist can do that. A licensed therapist can do that. A life coach cannot take that certification and do anything therapy. We can't use life coaches by law are not supposed to use any type of terminology everything is supposed to be normal language no diagnosing language a life coach cannot use any diagnosing language like narcissist because that is a diagnosis like manic depressive that is a diagnosis anxiety that is a diagnosis life coaches cannot use those terms and that right there it so it put this doctor, in my view, no different than Megan Thee Stallion. Megan Thee Stallion uses her body to sell music. Would we listen to Megan Thee Stallion if she dressed and carried herself like Adele? Adele, who is now with lebron's agent rich paul if the music is quality we don't care how the artist is dressed but because megan the stallion's music lacks quality and like real bars that make you think she twerks and so the twerking holds your attention to listen to the music so much so that kamala harris felt Megan the Stallion would be good for a convention. Our society is in the toilet and the toilet is stopped up and we don't have a plunger or a plumber and it is starting to stink because the junk, the waste cannot be flushed because it's so much in the pipe that it's at a standstill. That's our society today. Because when you have therapists who dress like a stripper and wants to work with men, and this is, and I want to enlighten y'all women and let y'all know something. The only reason why Deion Sanders brought Brittany Renner on his show, I mean, to his school, is so that he could meet her in person. She does not carry a message that a college coach actually cares about. She's a great person. I know her personally. She is. She's a great person. She's very smart, like she, street smart. 
Like she she has a lot of sense. But those of y'all don't know, she got a lot of sense. I can't knock her or bash her. Her online persona does not match her behind the scenes conversation. I know her personally. So y'all got to realize this one thing about me is a lot of the people I be talking about, I done met and talked to personally. But I still have to tell the truth regardless of who it's about. And anybody who know me can tell they truth about me. And you know what Brittany Renner told me? She said, Tony, you are one of two men that I have met that have never made me feel awkward, that have never said something kind of off to me or like came at me. She said, you one of two men. And the other guy was, I think his name, I can't remember his name. I think his name is Van. And, and, and I'm saying his name just so that y'all don't think it's somebody else that she done met. And But at that time, I don't know if she had met everybody that we have seen she has met. So don't take that. But this man, he used to work on TMZ, the black guy. And now he got a little podcast himself, I think. And she said, me and him are the two guys that have not made her feel uncomfortable or like shot our shot at her. And... The on, that's the same reason why Cam Newton brought her on the show. The same reason why these other people bring her on. They want to be in her presence because she twerk online. She used to. Now she a Muslim. The same. The reason why Nick Cannon and Cam Newton gave this woman a platform, the doctor a platform to look them in the eyes and tell them about themselves. Is because they are not intimidated by her. And they do not have a real respect for her. And it's because of how she portrays herself. Both of them individuals, I'm pretty sure, know who I am. But have not called me for a sit down. To have a man to man talk about the relationship stuff that's happening in society. Because there's a different level of respect and knowledge and there's a different viewpoint and no man wants to sit next to a man who the general consensus of women would consider more of a man than him so because most women want a man who can be married and faithful and responsible with the children they bring into the world and creating a safe, sound household, most women would see a man who is married and supposedly faithful, based on what they can see, they would consider that man more of a man than a man who has multiple baby mamas and still has not married and settled down and stayed married. And so here's the thing. That's where I'm talking about the void in a man's heart. When we have a void and when we have insecurity and when we haven't been affirmed for our greatness as a human, when we haven't been affirmed for our heart and our mind and our spirit, our soul, we feel insatiable we feel inadequate we feel incomplete and that leads us to these women and woman after woman after woman after woman because for a short amount of time that woman makes us feel seen she makes us feel heard she makes us feel loved she makes us feel appreciated and desired and wanted but then the feeling fades and now we want to be filled up all over again by another woman. And that's what leads a man from woman to woman. He gets to a place to where he does not want to do the work to change in the areas he needs to change. And so therefore, he, this woman is no longer compatible with him. Because she wants more than he is willing to give. Not more than he is capable of of giving. She wants more than he is willing to give. At that junction in his life. So 
That's what has to be understood. And another thing what you have to understand is we all still learning. We all still growing. There are some things that I'm going to say wrong with my grammar. There's words I'm going to use out of context. Actually, I don't know if you all know that, but Camp Newton is known for that. He is like the king of saying the wrong word, him and Deion Sanders, because they sit with a lot of microphones in their face because of the life. But they, they are like on the other end of the spectrum from Stephen A. Smith, who is a wordsmith. Like Cam Newton is known for misusing a word like he, he uses words he has heard, but has never read the definition of. And so he uses them out of context all the time. The doctor actually was trying to say uh, recidivism at the end of the interview. And she said the recidivism. She said we're trying to affect the recidivism rate. And now now being said. If you know the word, you know the word. If you don't, you don't. And so, but the word she said, I, I, I'm just like, okay. Okay. That word is recidivism. All right. And then she just, she defined it. She said, meaning going back into the prison system, but said the word completely wrong. And if you know the word recidivism, you know the word recidivism. And if you study it, you understand it, then you know the recidivism rate is around 85% based on the studies that's out there, which means a person who has offended, 85% of them will reoffend. So it proves that jail and prison, which jail is 12 months or less, prison is 366 days or more. That's why when you see somebody get sentenced to 366 days, because that's the line between jail and prison. So a lot of people, but I was a criminology major, so that's how I know that. But, and that's what they taught us in criminology. But if you never took those classes, then we call a lot of people be like, yeah, my family members in jail for 30 years. And it's like, no, that's prison. Jail is the county jail. That's the little holding area while you waiting on arraignment and you waiting on your trial and you waiting on all of this stuff. And then when you get your sentence, if it's 366 days or more, you get shipped to prison. In most cases, some people will be just left in jail for two, three years or what have you, because they either didn't get sentenced or they waiting on a trial or they case. And so when she said that word, I said, see there. People will, I ain't see not one person in the comments call it out because most people don't know themselves. But again, that's what I'm trying to say is we could have all this education. Like, listen to Benjamin Crump. He is a lawyer that is on everybody's case and he taught like I taught. I might talk better than he taught. He just be the bumping gums and it you be like, now, how did you read law books and take law exams? But it just go to show you it's a difference between the brain and the mouth and that the way we talk. So he could have had a speech impediment growing up or he could have been late to talk. But that don't mean his brain doesn't work and he's not able to go through school and get a law degree and pass the bar. But we also don't know if lawyers, if it's a way to cook the books. Just like Dr. Death, who became a whole surgeon and knew nothing about surgery and killed so many people doing back surgery because he finessed his way through school. He was able to get A's on the test. He was able to finesse the, the professors because he was a former football player, either D1 or NFL. So you can't get. But in our world, we so brainwashed that we think a title means somebody is better than us and smarter than us when life is teaching us the lessons every day that doctors and counselors and therapists and all of these people are reading and taking tests to know about we we living it we have lived it and so in that interview that's where 
Cam was trying to like hold her accountable and say like, well, who are you to give advice? Like how, what are, who's in your circle? Like, how do you know anything about love and relationships? If you grew up in a broken home and you've never had a home yourself with a husband and kids. And he was right for that because yeah, it's one thing to go to school and to read. And, and she said, well, I have people in my life and people in my circle and but he got under her skin and she became more emotionally unintelligent than him because after he asked that tough question she got crunk in the next couple of answers to the where she leaning into the camera and she talking and she getting crunk and then she next question so now back to the stereotype of black women Fed right into it. After a tough question, she got hot under the collar. She went to answering the questions aggressively. And then she did what James 3 tell us not to do. She got beside herself, got a little arrogant, really, really thought she was cooking. And she said, I caught that pick. And Cam called her out on that. He said, just because you leaning forward, and just because you pointing at your camera and you looking in your camera don't mean you caught a pit. So Cam was actually her mirror. They on the same level. They is on the same exact level. Like she, Cam Newton is the type of man she dressing for. I, I, somebody did not tell her this. But a high functioning man would never take a woman who dressed the way she dressed in a lot of her posts and especially on that interview seriously. So that's why Cam asked her, he said, am I high functioning and like high value or she, he, was, he was like based on your assessment. And then she did the Jedi mind trick. And a lot of people don't understand this, but Jezebel Spirits knows this. If you make someone feel inadequate or unworthy, it makes them seek your approval even the more. So she told him that he's high value, but basically he low functioning. Cameron want to hear that? He did not want to hear that. So he didn't even want to, he really didn't know how to wrap up the conversation because he didn't get to hear what he wanted to hear. Now that could be the truth. But, and and then she alluded to, well, some of the things that I, you know, could say or would say, that'll be in a one-on-one -on -one session. So now, now she getting a client, a celebrity client. And he probably may pay her fee to do sessions with her would not be worth would not be worth it. would not be worth it not gonna learn a thing not gonna learn a single thing y'all gotta forgive me because that's just how i looked at that conversation i'm like this right here is just a bunch of bumping of the gums me and my wife were sitting there you know we we were doing our own thing or whatever. And I said, baby, you all right? I said, everything cool with you? I said, how you feeling? I said, I said, how do you feel about us being together, but us being like into our own thing? She was reading one of her fiction books and I'm listening to this, doing research. She said, I'm fine with it. She said, I love it. She's like, it's cool. She's like, we, we just chilling. She's like, you need days like this. So we sitting there in the bed. We got the TV going. I'm listening to the interview. She reading a book. And then we check in. I pause it, tell her about this interview, tell her how, you know, just my perception of it and what I'm reading. I showed her the young lady outfit and, you know, told her a little bit about it and all of that. And we just kind of looking and talking about it. And I just seen the whole conversation as a low functioning conversation to use her word. Like it just didn't really drive a point home it was like two sides of the same coin it was kind of like she ain't no virgin so we don't know if she done had abortions 
And that's why she don't have kids. We don't know if she is barren and can't have kids. She ain't tell us all her business. So, but with the way she done lived life, she's talking about she had ex fiancés And the way she dressed, I would assume she's not a virgin. So if you done had ex fiancés and you're not a virgin, you done had some sex. Have you ever been pe- pregnant? Can you get pregnant? So basically, if she was a man, she would be Cam Newton because Cam has done the same thing she has done, been in multiple relationships, having sex. But as a man, when you put sperm in a woman and she gets pregnant, the choice on what she does with the baby is no longer yours. She get to decide if she want to keep that child or not. So if this doctor who is single or publicly single, never been married, no kids, has been sexually active, if she was a man, she could also have multiple baby mamas and multiple kids because she's been sexually active. So she could have impregnated multiple them ex fiancés if she was a man. So her and Cam talking was two sides of the same coin. She could become the very same thing Cam Newton is because she could meet a man tomorrow, get married in six months, 12 months, get pregnant, have a child, and then go through a divorce. Now she's a single mother and then meet another man, get married, have a child, because I just seen a lady post, she pregnant at 54. I'm praying everything go well with the pregnancy. So it, it's it's new today. It's different. It's different with the medicine we got today and the, the hospitals we got today. Things being stretched, time being made different. So and then get in another serious relationship, get pregnant, have a second child and go through another breakup. Before you before you know it, she it, she literally could become the Cam Newton. All of us can. It just Cam Newton ski no ski no and then the woman want to keep the child and he either is in agreement with it or in the first kids the first child or maybe even second we don't know if he was in agreement and the woman just kept it anyway we don't know we also don't know if cam got women pregnant and they did not keep it because he he didn't want one with them and he put pressure on them and he really really hurt they feeling really really pressured them really really told them or paid them or whatever we don't know because he's not telling all his business so we on the outside looking in, but based on what I could see and what they said out their mouth and what their body language said, they hugged and made up at the end. And that's what one of my NBA players called throwing a rock and hiding your hand. How she she got under that skin now and she tested him and she took over his conversation and she she big mama them. She was like, hey, she little boy them. She little boy them and she embarrassed them, but she understands psychology psychology expert she could very well be a psychology expert and she plays it to her advantage with how she dress and things of that nature how she dress that disarms a man he don't even really feel like getting crunk with no woman or, or checking her or holding her in her place now if that was me having a conversation with her, i would have told her just like i told a young lady one time who asked a question on here i had all her breasts out and she was asking about her man her nfl executive boyfriend and i'm like He's not looking for no serious woman because a man who's looking for a serious woman is not looking for no woman with all her breasts out. And this coming from a man who was a former womanizer. That's not what serious men looking for because we don't want to have to change you. We don't want to have to tell you how to dress. So that's also why she's single because she want a high functioning man. But what she don't realize is a high functioning man don't want her. And the men that she say wanted her, she didn't want them and her ex fiancés and she walked away because they was, she called high functioning and low value or low value and high functioning, whatever the reason was, is she is not resembling what she want to attract. And the reason being is because she doesn't understand the male psyche. She don't understand how men view women because 
99% of men who talk to her is going to tell her what she wants to hear. And when a man says something she don't want to hear, she's going to do him the way she did Cam Newton and not listen to what he's saying. She's not seeking to understand. She's seeking to be understood. Which Stephen R. Covey says, seek to understand, then be understood. So he asked her, do you want to be married? She said, absolutely. But I'm here to tell you, if you dress like that, you are going to attract a Cam Newton and you are going to attract a Nick Canton. See me, if I had a podcast, I would not be just solely based on how she portrays herself and how she uses her body in her portrayal and in her marketing it's not about fashion to me because that's not even high fashion. That's not even fashionable when you dress like a stripper who is on her off day. That's not fashionable. It does not look like old money. It does not look sophisticated. It does not look smart. It looks like an Atlanta housewife going to one of their little get togethers. It looked terrible to a real man. So if I had an outlet, a podcast, I would not bring her on my podcast to give a single word of advice because her imagery is a hindrance to men who are struggling with lust. So she cannot be a catalyst and a deliverer for men who are struggling with womanizing because she is hanging in their face what they have been conditioned to lust after. When there are women who could hang it out, like I could look at Michelle Obama and tell that she has a shape, that she got thighs and hips and booty, that if she wanted to swing that thing, that she could have men falling out. But she don't do that because of perception and because of understanding of how she wants her message to be received and what she wants to portray. Oprah got the money to go get any type of body she want to. But she don't do that because of how she wants to be portrayed, nor does she go do that and then get all the skin. I mean, show all the skin. And so what you got to understand is perception matters. So I'm not ready to be corporate. I'm not ready to be something that I'm not. So I'm not ready to dress all up and to wear a suit every day and to sit in my office with a suit and a tie on a three-piece suit like the gentleman who passed away used to do i'm not i because to me it don't make sense it don't make sense now on my podcast that i posted with my mentee caleb curl on the episode that's came out which would be yesterday because this i'm shooting it on the day of but this will go up the next day so yesterday if you go to louder than words with Caleb Curl and Tony Gaskins, you will see I had on a blazer, but under the blazer, I had on a T-shirt. And I had on, you can't see my feet, but I had on tennis shoes and I had on khaki pants, I think, or jeans. No, I had on blue jeans. So that's where I'm at. But I'm not I'm not there with the full button-up shirt, the tie, the blazer, because I'm not on TV. And I'm not trying to go on TV right now. But if I, I could do it. So we have to understand perception. And then also, I'm not trying to reach the people who judge people by their accent and by their outfit. So therefore, I'm not trying to reach that demographic who I, I'm not trying to talk to them. I want to talk to the people who feel like there isn't representation for them with a country accent. And maybe that's what she is doing. And to where she doesn't want to reach the people who look at her outfits as scantily clad or Jezebelish 
and she wants to reach that culture who is into that body con and lace see-through cat suits and all of that type of stuff the one piece cat suits and stuff of that nature maybe she's trying to reach that demographic but to me and the type of man that i am and the men that are like me because i i see two types of men grown men grown boys it's one type of man that like that type of woman and it's another if you go to sheree gaskins page i don't tell my wife how to dress every outfit she posts that is her doing i don't tell her how to dress she choose her outfits and if i had to dress a woman if my daughter well, if I had a daughter and she was growing up and I was giving her outfit tips, it would be exactly like my wife dress. And that's honestly and the reason why men like me want a woman who covers up and don't show everything online and not every post is a selfie is because we understand men and we don't want our woman to make her privates public. And we want her to be a mystery because a mystery is more attractive than a tell all. We want her to save something for us. If another man has basically seen all of her body, then what is special for us as her husband? And that's why men like me, we also don't do thirst traps. So if you go down my timeline, you don't see any modeling. Like just like me taking a selfie, trying to like catch the right lighting and show like the light, like my skin and face and beard and eyes in that lighting. Because I'm not trying to be a thirst trapper for the women who may be attracted to a man who is my skin color or looks like me or my head shape or whatever, because I have a wife. So I'm not trying to look for anybody. Now, I get it. I see some guys, they model and they post pictures of themselves, but it's like typically it's a brand deal. Like they are ambassador for that suit jacket or that t-shirt or that watch or whatever it is. But I don't trust men who post selfies for no reason. And the same way I do not trust women who post a woman is different because she's feminine, but just post so many selfies and just always, okay, just, okay, that's your face. Okay. And show me what you reading. Like, what are you feeding yourself with? What are you reading? What are you eating? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Nobody care about your hair slaying and your makeup slaying and all of that. And it's like, and then if you're going to show an outfit, like, show versatility. Like, not just all one theme, all one type of look, which is just sex appeal, you know, sexy. And so that's the thing what we have to understand is like we have a responsibility. And that's why James 3 said not all of you should become teachers because it's that it's a high call and you have to represent it. So it's kind of like if I'm on here cursing and stuff and that's the thing like, you know, I, I would go on Cam Newton podcast, even though he smoked cigars. And I would let him smoke a cigar. And even though I'd be kind of choking and kind of struggling to breathe a little bit, it just, you know, when in Rome, do what Romans do. But, and I also, honestly, me, on, me personally, I want to go on Cam show to talk to him. Like to hear his mindset. Because I understand being an athlete and having a desire to be a pro athlete and him and what he had to go through, I could only imagine. Like he played division one football. I went to a division two. I played division two football because division one wouldn't offer me an outright scholarship. They wanted me to come to camp and earn it because I played at a small high school that didn't have a lot of publicity. And my high school only had a football team for two years. 
and that was my junior and senior year so i didn't have enough tape and enough to show a school that i'm worth them paying a full scholarship so they gave me what they call a preferred walk-on where you get you will get treated just like a scholarship player but you got to come in and earn a spot and you will be in line for a spot if somebody transfers or quits or gets kicked off the team and i just didn't want to take that gamble so i gave that spot those spots up at the florida schools that offered that like florida state and florida atlantic and miami and other d1 schools outside of the state of florida and i went where they paid twenty eight thousand dollars a year for me to go to school and still messed it up because it wasn't challenging enough so when i look at cam newton's life and i see that you know he built how he built and so he looked like the prototypical nfl player and possibly could have been a 110 meter hurdler, hurdler or 400 meter hurdler or possibly could have been a small forward or something in basketball or what have you you know other things he probably could have played tennis or golf he an athlete and so i know that he has a lot of pressure that he went through a lot of pressure he went through a lot of expectation he he went through a and still going through a maturation process that he also has some head trauma and just some some social trauma some life trauma some relational trauma and some parental trauma you know he says dad is his hero but he says some things that his dad didn't do that he wish he would have did but not knocking him for it because he did the absolute best he could and he he loved him with everything but whatever his dad did or did not do it did affect him because i'm pretty sure when his dad had influence in his life like more influence in his life before he made millions cam had a low cut he had a low cut and he looked like he could leave the field and go into any boardroom in america now he would not be let in any boardroom but it's a space of arrogance it's a space of i'll do what i want to do how i want to do it regardless of your perception of me but what he doesn't realize is perception is reality and perception can give life or perception can take life meaning how someone perceives you can determine how long they will put up with you so when cam newton says i know there's not 30 or whatever 32 quarterbacks in the nfl that's better than me i 100 percent agree but what he doesn't realize is his boisterous loud ostentatious only i'm i'm doing what we be doing with these words that is it's it's not conducive to a locker room because when you show that you don't want to fit the mold and you want to break the mold and you want to grandstand and you want to be a spectacle and you want to draw attention to your hats and your hair and your outfit and i as a gm and a team owner can choose a quarterback who will be cohesive with the system and will buy into the program and not try to be bigger than the program and louder than the program and he's willing to have a corporate haircut because he is working for a multi-billion dollar organization and although he is an individual this is a organization and our goal is to look like and represent what our customers our consumers want us to look like and represent because we are a product for a game we are playing a game we are not changing lives we are entertainment 
But in this entertainment, this is a family environment. So if I don't want my son to have dreads because I am from Florida and I associate dreads with thugs, then I don't want my son to look up to a man who has dreads. And this is the quiet part out loud. This is what maybe even Stephen A. Smith can't say, what maybe Shannon Sharp can't say. But it is the reality. And yes, none of us want to say it. I don't even want to say it because I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to take that stance. But what I am articulating is what those who are in power say behind closed doors in a room where they feel no one will ever repeat what they've said. You got to remember, I worked in the front office of professional organizations and also college organizations. So I hear what the GM and the owner and the president and the assistant GM and the head coach says about players. And this is where people drop the ball. And, and this is also what will hinder other people. And, and, and it's black or white. The same thing with like a Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel act like he from the ghetto. Is he? I think he is as good as Baker Mayfield. I think he could be better. I think he's a smaller white version of Lamar Jackson. But even with Lamar Jackson now, see, this is the thing with Lamar Jackson. For one, he got interesting hair, but it's not really a distraction. And he got an interesting accent, but it makes him endearing. And he's also not trying to be bigger than the program. But his athleticism outweighs his image or mindset or accent or hairstyle. When you got somebody that is that dynamic, you can wear and say and do what you want to say, wear, and do as long as you're useful. Now, the minute you start to decline, you're getting packed up and shipped out. Because now when men, when we start to decline, we start to go through a crisis, an emotional crisis, a mental crisis, and we start to cry out for help with our cars, with our clothes, with our hair, with our language, with our actions, we start to cry out for help. If you notice, a lot of men who start to go through a decline will start to get a bunch of tattoos or start to change the hairstyle, change the beard style, change the clothing, change the cars, change the flashiness, will start to change something. But it all comes from a deficit acting out from insecurity because a lot of people who have everything don't know they have everything. Like even with the doctor, the young lady that was on Cam Newton's show, like she doesn't realize that because of societal constructs and because of her look, even all the way back to slavery, looking more like the biracial slave, who the slave master got a slave pregnant and the daughter looks like this doctor. And I think she has colored eyes. She doesn't realize that because she has that look and America has chosen that look, she doesn't have to wear the same dresses as a black woman who has been a victim of colorism and a victim of shaming because of her lips or her nose or whatever it may be. 
So she is dressing, seeking the praise and attention and admiration and adulation when she literally could put on a business suit and 10x her income just because of human psychology, just because of how people pursue us, how people perceive us. Guess what? The same applies for myself. I could put on a suit, get a doctorate, and if I wanted to, 10x my income. And so the thing is, is I'm not attention seeking. That's why I'm not showing, trying to show chest and abs. And that's why I'm not trying to thirst trap with selfies. And that's why I don't use custom thumbnails on my videos. And I don't fill out the description box. And I don't use keyword tags because I'm not trying to grow fast. That's why I don't go on podcast all the time. And got that's why I don't have a manager or a booking agent or any or a publicist trying to get me out there because I'm not attention seeking. I just show up and do the work and I let the work do the rest. Now, there are podcasts that reach out and I turn them down because I'm not going to go on a podcast that's smaller than my audience. It don't make sense for me to take away time from my work and time from my family to go on a podcast that doesn't have either a different demographic or an audience that is worth my time because I could sit here and bring people to my audience and I could disseminate the message that God has given me versus going and, as the Bible calls it, casting pearls to swine. When you are going somewhere that you don't want to be hurt, that people don't want to hear what you talk about anyways, like they ain't trying to hear you. It's just like that that event that's going around the country with the guy who he and I had a back and forth on the podcast with the two young black brothers out of Atlanta. And they brought the gentleman on. He has an event that he goes around. Well, he invited me to be a part of the event. And I told him no, because your your events are beneath me, like y'all conversation that y'all are talking about. I live on a whole nother level and I don't agree with none of what y'all be talking about so i'm not finna come and bring a higher level conversation to people who are not interested in that because and that is proof because they're coming to your event and you are a single man hosting relationship events the irony alone lets me know that the people in the audience are not serious about their love lives or they're nosy. And if you nosy, you petty. And I don't want to talk to nosy and petty people, nor do I want to talk to people who are not serious about getting their life in order and learning from people who have done what they're trying to do. And so I'll create my own space and I will bring certain people for certain reasons, but the space will be conducive for learning and growing and changing and going to the next level, not just wallowing in the mud like pigs. And that's the thing is we just got to be real. Like I'm not a know-it-all. I'm not all of that. I'm nowhere near perfect. I'm still learning and growing and evolving as a man, but I believe in calling a spade a spade. I believe in keeping it all the way 100% real. Like there are women who I've had multiple women tell me, Tony, you are mean. Like you too. They would, they would, they say mean, and they say, you have to be like nicer to women. And I'm like, I don't care to be because you're used to men flirting with you and you're used to men placating to you and you're used to men simping. You're used to men saying what you want to hear. You're used to men walking on eggshells. I want to hear your truth and I want you to hear my truth. And we could talk about it like that. As long as we can listen, we can understand the conversation is tennis 
uh, dialogue, decalogue, that we are having a non judgmental conversation. And we're not getting in our feelings and we're expressing how we feel. We're expressing how we perceive and all of those things. And so that was the thing that I saw with that interview is that people saying Cam couldn't like, like she was telling him the truth. But I heard it said the message matters, but so does the messenger. So to Cam Newton he sees a lot of women dressed like she dressed a lot of women with that hairstyle and L edge uh, gel down edges and breasts hanging out and long lashes and face full of makeup and lipstick and liner and he see that all the time so just off of cognitive bias or or just it could be cognitive dissonance it just he, he it's hard to receive a lesson from someone who is positioning themselves in the same way that you see an instagram thought you just you don't even realize that you have your guards up you don't even realize that you're annoyed with her talking so much because you don't respect her. Like when someone is talking a lot and they're giving game, you're going to be able to follow the conversation and you're going to enjoy what you're hearing because you feel enlightened. Cam was getting annoyed. He wanted to go back and forth and have a conversation that move, but she wanted to hear herself talk and did not have the emotional intelligence and the wherewithal to understand that this is not the set where you do long form answers. When you're talking to a man who is like 10 years younger than you, and living a totally different lifestyle, totally different experiences, totally different background and upbringing. You got to position the conversation differently so more ground can be covered. Also, with that stuff, I don't like the childish little games they do. That's that's something that that is like it, it, some game he did inside out. I don't like that kind of stuff. Like, if I'm on a podcast, like, bro, let's leave that out of there. Like, I'm, I'm not finna do no game based on a, a movie and this, all this here. Like, let's have a conversation. Something that's gonna move the needle. All, all it right here. That's just in folly. Like, I know the producers think that it's a necessary element, but it's not necessary. We're not children. We don't need to be entertained. We're sitting and watching to hear a deep conversation that makes us think and helps us grow it ain't even about entertainment and so i don't be liking all that kind of stuff on that stuff when they have these different segments and the segments be like gamey like it's a game show or something it's like well let's just talk let's just have a conversation man and go back and forth and let's be mindful so what i think podcasts should do is they should have a little timer that's that's non-intrusive but when when the host starts speaking it's hit and it just says uh, just a little soft ding, and that means that's the end of your question and then when the answer is being answered so it's kind of like chess you know on chess they got that timer they had they be hitting that little timer that's what it needed to be so it, it need to be give me a 60 second question give me a 120 second answer and now let's get to the next question so so that because in essence that's how conversation works when we talking and a lot of times the conversation we we jumping in we cutting each other off and so it became kind of jarring as a listener for me because it was points that where the tension was so tense was so tight it was so you could cut it with a butter knife like you don't need no machete you don't need no steak knife. Like it, it was so 
ugh, you could just take a little butter knife and, and, and it, it's boom because it was it was so tense it was like a but she older so she was able to kind of be nice nasty whereas cam he more a little more of a straight shooter and he said it too he he said he said it like put his hands up he was like i'm trying to be like i'm trying to you know and not say what i but he kind of also said he kind of expressed a little frustration and then so i think she mentioned like when his cigar went out that he was getting a little he was like yeah i was starting to get like a little tense i was starting to get and i don't know if that was just based on the cigar which it could have been because that could be you know calming his nerves or whatever but which which is a bad habit man that that smoking you know him and ocho cinco really promote that stuff it's like but again, that's what I'm talking about. Like we have those, we have vices as a, as a, as men. Some of us we have them behind closed doors. So it's like if I'm at home and I feel like, man, I just want to chill. I just want to relax. If I have me some whiskey or something like that, that's that's a vice. That is a vice. But if it's just me and my business and nobody could see it and it's not triggering an alcoholic or somebody who's fighting alcoholism or there's a lot of guys who get in relationships and uh, we're gonna go about 10 more minutes i'm trying to go as long as that interview was i gave that time of my life away that i won't get back so i'm, I'm finna move the needle forward with this hill this hill lesson and if there could be a, a lot of men who are being asked by their woman to stop smoking weed and when they get online and they looking for like positive inspiration and stuff like that and they see they see shannon sharp promoting the alcohol and the black and mild or and even if it's just in jest and they see the pivot promoting gambling and beer and they see cam you know smoking cigarettes and like just all the different podcasts promoting like vices and men we are creature of habit so the last thing we need is a vice like i wish all these podcasts would like team up and give a price to me like for my site my mentor.life which is a space where you can go hire a life coach and some of them are therapists and team up with betterhelp.com and let the advertising be advertising of sites like audible.com betterhelp.com mymentor.life skillshare.com and drive your audience to non-vices drive your audience to things like well, me and caleb if we when we get bigger and we grow and we start bringing in advertising we're not going to do no alcohol no gambling we're not driving nobody to no vice we're going to drive them to health and wellness and it may be less money if i'm pretty sure it's less money but it is what it is because what people don't understand is like when you in these positions you have a world of influence and people are coming to you in vulnerable spaces so what the doctor don't understand is that lust is is it's a demon that becomes a drug so what she don't understand that there are men who watch her interview and they went to the bathroom to masturbate like there are men who went to her page and masturbated three or four times to her showing so much skin and i know that women will say well hey that's that's their fault for being nasty for being a pervert but no it's also her fault for dressing in a way that it's not necessary to dress that way when you have business suits when you have full shirts when you have it's kind of like let me give you an example like uh that lady named aoc she in the politic world and the other lady named rye and candace owens 
Like, those are all beautiful women, but look how they dress. They don't dress like the doctor dress, but they still beautiful. They still look presentable. They still look, you still can consider that sexy or and sophisticated. So that's what I mean. It's a million ways to get your message across without being a hindrance to somebody's spirit. So, hey, this Tony Gaskins, hey, got some big tomorrow. Make sure you check in tomorrow. I think the video, the announcement is like one o'clock. I can't say too much before it. Can't too say too much on the video because you'll learn about it on there and you'll have the link. But got some big tomorrow, Tuesday, August 27th. And for the next, you know, some time, can't say actual exact date. So how long? Because I don't really know. I'll be touching on it and telling you about this opportunity that to me, it means a lot in these times and where we at. And also it's a give back from me and a partnership, so to speak. So stay tuned, check that out. And we're going to, because I want you to be able to check out that right there i hold off on the other stuff like wealthofhealth.com and tonygassonsacademy.com because i'm i'm putting my focus over here on that there but you'll hear about it and to anybody who was mentioned in this video and if you just really wanted to see everything i said about you and you got to this point please reach out to me if you want to have a conversation and if you want to have a conversation privately or publicly, I'm fine with it. Like everything that I say is coming from a place of love. It's coming from a good heart and it's coming from a place of enlightenment and, and a place where I want you to be enlightened to the perception of a healthy outsider, like someone who is living without trauma and not living in willing sin like adultery and all the debauchery and just coming from a place of being stable and being whole and yet still growing and giving you that perspective. Cause a lot of times you get the perspective of people who are in fornication or in adultery or addicted to marijuana, addicted to alcohol, addicted to masturbation, pornography, and you're getting their feedback on how amazing you are and how great you are and how smart you are, but people speak from where they are. So I want to give a perspective from where I am and what it looks like to me. And not to say that I'm right, but I want to share my perspective. And you equally could share your perspective. And, and people can see if we're operating from hate, if we're operating from anger, if we're operating from jealousy, if we're operating from competition, like people can see that. And the only reason I'm speaking on this, because I honestly don't like having people name in my mouth. But being a leader, I also understand I have a responsibility. So when people come to me and I normally it has to be like at least two or three people for me to speak on something. But what they're saying is, Tony. I value your insight. I value your take. I listen to your message, but I also listen to these type of messages. I want your take of this message because I believe you will give me a different perspective or you may show me some things that you saw that I did not see. And I want to hear that to hear if I feel like there's any grounds to what you're saying, if there's any validity to what you're saying. So when people come to me, that's why I speak on this topic. I, I, if you notice, 99% of my videos, I don't have nobody's, anybody's name in the title because I don't clout chase. And if you notice, I, if I mention somebody's name, I don't have a thumbnail like the gossip pages that have their face and all these faces. And I don't like doing that type of stuff. So I want you to understand, anybody listening to this, for me, this ain't about clout chasing. This is about helping the people who support me, who say, Tony, I want to hear what you got to say. Now, there are topics I get sent that I just don't feel like there's anything there. Like there's not really enough to talk about. And it may just mean something to that particular person, which may mean they need a one on one session. And so I don't bring it up and I don't address it. But I've I got a lot of 
topics that's kind of getting backlogged now. So I'll be addressing on, I'll be addressing stuff and speaking on things that are in the media that people are trying to sort through and want to weigh it with different perspectives. Because as the Bible says, there is wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And, and so like with the doctor, I mean, she knows who I am. And that's why, again, it, it makes it hard for me to do these messages, because when you are in the vicinity with somebody and somebody know you like know of you, you don't necessarily want to speak on them because it, it's kind of personal. But I have to just be honest and just share the truth. Like I've seen her do with Cam Newton right in his face. She told him what she thought and she did not mince her words like she told him. And I believe some of it might take root. I'm not sure, but I can just tell by his feedback. Like, I, I feel like Oprah, if Oprah was sitting there and talking 10 minutes, he wouldn't have been agitated. If Michelle Obama was sitting there talking for 10 minutes, he wouldn't have been agitated because of how he sees them. But I feel like he was agitated, not based on what she was saying, but just how long she was saying it. Because I'm pretty sure he's seen in comments and from several women that that they consider him a low functioning man, a deadbeat man. And he said that out of his mouth. He said some people don't think I'm high functioning because of my situation. And he was talking about, you know, him having the children from the multiple women. So he already knew what she was saying. Like he's already heard it and obviously has not slowed him down because when you in the light that he's in you learn to silence the noise and to just live how you want to live which can be detrimental so hey this is tony gaskin god bless you sorry went over well i might be about right around time god bless you we'll talk soon now today this right here going out but i'm actually out of state um in some meetings uh while this is airing so not buy it so i won't get won't get to see it and interact with y'all if, if i said it as a premiere i'm not sure if it was premiere but uh god bless y'all we'll talk soon